It's the writing. But that's just scratching the surface. Playing Starfield is an exercise in endless frustration, made all the more painful because the vast majority of its flaws stem from baffling top-level design decisions. Like Skyrim and Fallout 4, Starfield is fundamentally broken and it didn't need to be. I understand that Bethesda titles are intended as games where you can turn your brain off and have fun for a couple hours. However, there's no shortage of games like that these days, and many of them are more fun and more respectful of your time. Moreover, if you want an inch more than mindless fun from your video games, you're not gonna find it here. It's not about bugs, it's not about the updated engine, the performance, or anything else technical. Even if this game ran flawlessly, it would just be putting mediocre content in front of you as smoothly as possible. Starfield, like its predecessors, is a game that buys into the fallacy that quantity is equivalent to quality. It's built around shoveling so much shit in your face that's so easy to consume that the thought of doing or playing anything else is exhausting. Anti-immersion. Despite Starfield constantly crowing about the grandeur of exploring amongst the stars, this is a skin-deep affectation. All the wistful platitudes uttered in-game don't change the fact that the game is uninterested in its own genre or premise. Even though this is apparently a title Todd Howard has wanted to make for a long time, Starfield has no grand vision, no core themes or ideas to explore with any sort of depth, no story that someone was dying to tell. Seems the only enjoyment you can extract out of it is an endless, shallow dopamine treadmill of explore, kill, loot, explore, until you're too tired to continue. The strategy says this is a game designed around pecking some buttons and getting some corn. It's so staggeringly safe and boring I can't come to any conclusion except that it was designed to be that way. More than any other Bethesda title, Starfield has confirmed for me that the studio is no longer disguising their disrespect for the player's time, intelligence, agency, or imagination. Hi, I'm Gunmetal. I make high-effort shit posts, ones that often contain broad, sweeping statements like that last doozy. Although I get hyperbolic for comedy's sake and so I can try and have productive conversations about improving the medium as a whole, this time I'm doing so because I'm tired. I'm real tired. Tell me about the rabbits, Todd. This video is a long-form critique and analysis for Starfield. But like, why am I bothering? Why level all this criticism at Bethesda and Starfield? Why get so in-depth about something intended as brainless fun? After all, not every game has to be a rich artistic masterpiece, nor should they be. No one wants to slave away for 16 hours at the bullshit factory, then come home and play Pathologic. No. I'm digging deep into why Starfield sucks, because aiming for mediocrity and hitting the mark isn't something to celebrate. Bethesda used to make definitive role-playing games, games that push the boundaries of what video games can do and what they could be. They've since belt-sanded away every facet of their games that made them popular in the first place, out of a misguided directive to be as mass-market friendly as possible. What rubs salt in the wound is that they keep topping sales charts, so there's no actual incentive to improve them. Of course, I can't blame a massive corporate entity for acting like a massive corporate entity, but I question the necessity of it. The RPG dark ages of the early 2000s and 20-teens are over. Broader gaming audiences are capable of parsing more complex games with deeper mechanics and mature stories. Yet Bethesda still thinks being mass market friendly means you need to treat your customers like they're brain dead morons. That might sound a little entitled and pretentious, but I think it's valid to criticize their games in this way when Starfield is suffering from the same problems that plagued Fallout 3 15 years ago. To me at least, it seems like they've only gotten worse. With The Elder Scrolls VI in the earliest phases of production, it's an important time to be critical. I understand that's like trying to drain the Pacific Ocean with a five-gallon bucket. I'm not on so much copium that I think Bethesda's gonna make anything like Morrowind again, but it's insane how much missed potential there is in Starfield. That's another reason why I think people keep coming back to Bethesda games, why people keep making videos like these, why wide as an ocean, deep as a puddle keeps frustrating so many. They make ambitious games, but their ambition is solely directed towards maximalism. The drive to make their games as large and broad as possible. Games that can be everything, for everyone, forever. With a little imagination, it's pretty easy to see how rejecting this impulse could make these games so much more than they actually are. That's also why the Bethesda modding community is so huge. It wouldn't exist if these games didn't have a spark of something incredible buried under all the layers of annoying bullshit. Modern Bethesda games succeed despite their simplicity, not because of it. I've always held that their games being such huge successes is due to their presentation and marketing. They could have maintained their previous level of complexity and done equally well. Instead, we suffer the Bethesda curse. No one else is really making this type of RPG, meaning we have to endure every single condescending high-level design choice and oversimplified system just to experience them. In this regard, Starfield is no different. 
Every now and then, there's glimpses of potential. When the game stops talking, when it slows down, when it disengages from its tedious core gameplay loop, you can see the bones of something incredible. And then it's over, crushed under the weight of a dozen baffling design decisions that undercut themselves at every turn. Starfield is a game at war with itself, and playing it feels like walking on a field of rakes. You have to fight the game to get invested in the storytelling. You have to fight the game to roleplay. You have to fight the game to play it as intended. You have to fight the game to enjoy it at all. But before we get to unpacking all of that, I want to start off with the positives, that missed potential. After all, if it was totally bereft of interesting ideas or imagination, it'd be a Ubisoft game and I wouldn't bother complaining. So, in order to examine why Starfield sucks and how it's fundamentally broken, we first have to talk about that classic Bethesda magic, that spark of something fantastic that keeps us crawling back. From here on out, there will be very thorough spoilers for the entire game, so if you care about that, thanks for stopping by. I promise there's nothing in Starfield worth saving for yourself, but I still want to offer you the opportunity to click off. Ready? Let's get started. Everything good I have to say about Starfield comes with an asterisk, but that doesn't mean they're not still positives. Also, although I have been and will continue to be very critical of this game, I want to emphasize that my problems with it are not the fault of the devs who actually made it. Starfield's flaws exclusively stem from Bethesda's upper management and the design document they put together. It was those flawed directives that led to Starfield being the way it is, not the people who put in the blood, sweat, and tears to build the game. I hate seeing people call Bethesda games lazy when that only applies to the higher-ups that want to keep making the same profit machines, not the hundreds of people that have to labor under that myopic scope. In reality, an insane amount of time, effort, talent, and craft went into Starfield. This is a project that involved hundreds of people working endless hours for eight years to put together, and it shows. It oozes production value. The game existing as it does is a monumental achievement, bugs and all. My hat goes off to them. To that end, I can say at the very least, Starfield feels like the best version of Fallout 4. If you enjoyed Fallout 4 despite its numerous flaws, you'll love Starfield. Granted, it doesn't have the contiguous open world map, but I find that a worthy trade-off for not experiencing Fallout 4's writing. Starfield has cleaner gunplay, more interesting weapons, more engaging handcrafted dungeons, better art direction, less oppressive level scaling, and better voice acting. That's something I want to highlight. Even though the actual dialogue is not fantastic, the delivery feels like a measurable step up from previous Bethesda titles. It's not always stellar, of course, but that's a ludicrous expectation to have in a game so massive. What's important is that I could tell the cast was trying their best to sell the lines they were given. Everything in Starfield feels a little bit better when the dialogue is given more explicit direction, when talented actors are given more space to give real performances. For example, the funeral scene. Your companion with the highest affinity in Constellation dies for dumb, preventable reasons in order to wring some cheap drama out of the story. However, when memorializing the dead character, the actors swung for the fences. They genuinely sound like they're grieving. Even if they couldn't make me care, it convinced me that the characters themselves did. On that note, I have to praise Emily O'Brien, Sarah Morgan's voice actress. Sarah's actual character writing is, at turns, boring, rote, and borderline psychotic. However, at the conclusion of her quest line, she takes a quiet moment to grieve for her fallen comrades. It's perfectly paced, perfectly executed, perfectly performed. And for a second, I felt an emotion. In a Bethesda game. And then we're back on the bullshit. That's also the theme for the best gameplay bits. While the copy-paste dungeons that get slapped down everywhere get old immediately, the handcrafted dungeons are like glimpses into the starfield that could have been. When the levels have a real idea behind them, the combat is elevated. The gameplay systems come into sharper focus. My favorite dungeon in the game is a derelict spaceship with fluctuating power. Its gravity drive switches off and on at regular intervals, changing up how you fight and how you explore it. In that same vein, clearing spacers out of an abandoned zero-g casino was also fun. While shamefully brief, it feels more special and vibrant. There's even colorful touches like a review explaining what a terrible idea it is to have a zero-g nostalgia bait casino. In the main quest, there's a sci-fi version of the time travel mission from Dishonored 2. Although lessened in that you have to switch over at specific locations and solve more boring problems, it's still a good level with a hidden golden ending for players that are paying attention. The Nashina Research Station is a bit of a slog on subsequent playthroughs, but it's the only level that takes advantage of alternate universes, and I think they did a pretty good job. The climax of the Ryujin questline, infiltrating Infinity Core, is the worst Dishonored level ever made, but it's in Starfield, which makes it fun and interesting. 
They put real effort into providing different ways to accomplish your objectives, even making sure not to force the player to use their new mind control Neuroamp. There's a couple more fun levels, but you get the idea. It's the unique locations that work the best. That also goes for the cities and towns of the settled systems. They're typically defined by a single, simple theme, but they still look incredible. Neon is the cyberpunk town, and treated with about as much depth as its name, but arriving at it for the first time, watching the lightning arc off the shield, and getting to run around the rooftops is genuinely cool. In addition, these towns typically have more interesting and varied quests that have intent behind them. There's two examples I want to discuss specifically. Although short, there's a brief questlet of sorts on Sidonia where a kid has you hang space frog posters around the colony. It's small and simple, but it goes a long way toward showing the conditions of the miners, the drudgery of the Martian landscape, how people would think and feel if they were subjected to such conditions. The other is resolving the brownouts in the well of New Atlantis. It's one of the first quests you can get, and doesn't involve much more than flipping switches, but there's clever intent behind it. It takes you all over both the well and New Atlantis proper, conveying through visual storytelling that the gleam and glamour of the United Colonies does not extend to all its citizens. It shows that there's people working within the system that care, but they're being crushed by bureaucracy and apathy in a quest about flipping switches. These are small and quick, but they represent a handful of good moments sandwiched between the oppressive core gameplay loop. I'm hoping by now you get what I mean when I say everything good has an asterisk. There's no better example of this, I think, than my favorite part of Starfield, the shipbuilding. The ability to design your own ship, paint it up, then walk around inside, decorate it, salute out of it, fight in it, etc. It's awesome. It feels like making your own secondary character within the narrative. With a little time and effort, you can come up with something truly unique and personal to you. It's also something you have to earn. It feels great when you can finally splurge and get the ship you want. It serves the narrative and the gameplay. This goes a long way towards facilitating player expression and creativity. The system is also deeply fucked. You have to grind out one skill to max to get access to all the parts, and then a separate skill to actually fly it, which is all rendered pointless anyway because space combat is awful. We'll talk more about these issues in depth later, but I don't think there's a better case study for how this game feels like it's trying its hardest to stop you from having fun at every turn. Finally, I want to talk about one thing I like that, unfortunately, also broke the game beyond repair. Becoming Starborn. I have many criticisms of Starfield's storytelling, but contextualizing New Game Plus as a diegetic consequence of reaching Unity is interesting and ambitious. On the surface. The fact that you can go through the story again and meaningfully behave as though your character already knows what's going to happen is a great idea. This mostly translates into shaving down the amount of time it takes to complete a main story playthrough, which is also smart, but allowing for this must have taken a ton of effort. Your foreknowledge of the story is a mechanic, to the point where you're even allowed to skip it. You also get to be more powerful as your skills and game knowledge carry over. You can do the content faster, you know where the best unique stuff is. This works well with how the game does level scaling. I'm never a fan of it, and it has its issues in Starfield too, but restricting it to specific star systems makes the early New Game Plus more engaging. Even though you lose your loot, you can still enjoy being overpowered in those earlier areas. In Skyrim and Fallout 4, the oppressive level scaling brutalized their combat systems, flattening the power curve into the most boring line possible. Not the case with Starfield. I also have plenty of complaints about the combat and loot, but at the very least the game lets you revel in being overpowered for a bit. The bigger issue with Starfield's New Game Plus system has to do with the writing surrounding it, and it's a multi-layered, insurmountable problem. When you walk into Unity, you're prompted with the line, Who will you be? What choices will you make? Your ship, weapons, items, and outposts are left behind in the old universe, leaving you with your background, skills, powers, and foreknowledge of what's to come. And therein lies the rub. You know what's going to happen. If you're invested in the game, you've probably already done the faction quests and had your fill of the side content. Then you get to experience the novelty of the Starborn dialogue options. Then, well, nothing. Yet you're incentivized to keep going, even though each hour of gameplay is providing diminishing returns at an exponential rate. Starfield's story and mechanics are designed around facilitating perpetual play. It's a game designed to be as easy as possible to consume with as few barriers to entry in order to maximize hours played. That's the intention, at least. Instead, by ending the story with Unity, by making New Game Plus this way, Starfield forces you time and time again to confront its largest and most glaring flaw. The settled systems are fucking boring. It is, without hyperbole, one of the worst settings I have ever experienced in a video game of this size and scope. Who Will You Be loses all meaning when the world itself lacks a single interesting idea or ounce of reactivity. There are no meaningful choices to make because the game world they take place in is devoid of imagination. This is why I'm so confident that Starfield was ruined from the top down. Building a setting this bland can only happen intentionally, at a project's inception. The positive section is over now. 
I cannot overstate enough how brutal of a setback the settled systems are to the overall experience. It is a brick wall of bad that you must surmount to enjoy anything about Starfield. It penalizes your curiosity by crumbling under scrutiny, and penalizes your intelligence by getting dumber and more nonsensical the more you think about it. And that's a goddamn shame. One of the primary reasons I gave Starfield an honest try is because science fiction, in all its forms, is my favorite genre of fiction. There's something deeply appealing about the vastness of space, our grand insignificance, and expanding or re-examining our scientific understanding. Whether it's relentlessly optimistic, brutally cynical, deeply horrifying, or grand and operatic, science fiction is a fantastic vehicle to examine the human condition in the postmodern artistic landscape. We kill God, and science fiction is how we perform the autopsy. Starfield, however, is not space-themed science fiction for any reason, except that it's sufficiently distinct from Bethesda's other intellectual properties. Starfield's aesthetics deliberately evoke the open-eyed wonder of early-stage space exploration, the glory days of NASA, of pursuing the final frontier and seeing what's out there, which is a cold and calculated deception. Ultimately, Starfield has as much love, respect, and investment in science and space exploration as people who believe in horoscopes. Its art direction, its premise, and its very genre all wrote a giant check Bethesda had no hope of cashing. In this lane of science fiction, what makes it memorable and evocative for me is not the sweeping vistas, strange alien creatures, or cool spaceships. That's just the surface level. What matters is the ideas and discussions these elements provoke. Starfield doesn't have anything except the surface level. The settled systems are a puree of every popular science fiction property from the past 60 years. Yes, even the one you're thinking of right now. It's not uncommon for sci-fi settings to borrow or straight up steal from one another, but they usually put some effort into recontextualizing them. The best questline in Starfield boils down to, hey, remember aliens? The more you like sci-fi, the worse Starfield is. You'll recognize familiar concepts constantly, and you can predict every story beat because you've seen it all before. The most sci-fi feeling moments are tiny questlets shoved as far away from the player's path as possible. Even then, it's like a greatest hits album, to which Starfield has nothing to add. It doesn't pose any questions or present ideas unique to itself. Am machine person? What if space Batman? Soldiers make friends? It's just so generic and tiresome. Not only that, but its aesthetics run contrary to everything presented to you in-game. It's using a grounded, hard science fiction art direction to tell bad Star Wars stories, which never feels to feel jarring and ill-fitting. The only identity Starfield has is it being a Bethesda game. Its systems, storytelling tropes, and gameplay modalities are cobbled together from different properties that don't cohere. The one theme Starfield really hammers at is reconciling rationality and spirituality, which would have been groundbreaking if I was 12, or this was 2002. And it never has anything to say about it because they're terrified the player might be offended. It's surreal to experience because you can feel the editor's notes butting in whenever the narrative is in danger of challenging you or getting too detailed. Every world-building detail within the settled systems is committed to being non-confrontational and being as agreeable and toothless as humanly possible. Starfield breaks new ground by being the first game written by an HR department. This isn't asking the players questions and letting them come to their own conclusions, it's mealy-mouthed corpo writing, talking out of both sides of their mouths about concepts they have no investment in. I don't expect you to take me at my word. We're going to talk about specific storytelling failures and mispotential soon, but it's important to bring this up first. Every flaw in Starfield is derived from this lack of narrative ambition. And this lack of ambition was intentional. The only thing it cares about is being big. Here's a quote from an ad disguised as an NPR interview. Design director Emil Pagliarulo, who oversaw much of the game's lore and quest design, understands that with a video game like Starfield, fun comes first. We're making a video game, he says. We're not making Anna Karenina. So Pagliarulo and the team made it their mission to create an escapist fantasy, where everything fun that could conceivably happen in space is possible. There's so much to unpack here, it's mind-boggling. When you approach making a game like that, it's easy to see how Starfield falls on its face. Obviously, incredible art can still be fun. Obviously, there's a vast spectrum of art between generic slop and fucking Tolstoy. Obviously, making an enormous game with so much stuff to do is still very ambitious. The issue here is that fun escapism, as defined by Bethesda games, is about never telling the player no, about letting them wander around doing whatever they want. This isn't how they actually play out, but it's clear that's how the studio defines Fun. The settled systems were written around the kill, loot, explore Bethesda gameplay loop. That's what came first. Everything else about the setting is subordinate to that directive. Anything that could interrupt the player pecking the button and getting the corn was surgically excised. 
Therefore, a bunch of vague noise about big ideas isn't a serious presentation of these topics. To me, it comes off as patronizing. It feels like I'm being treated with kitty gloves, like if my beliefs are challenged or I'm presented with a potentially uncomfortable idea, I'll turn the game off. And that kind of writing is diametrically opposed to what Starfield attempts to evoke. Safety, familiarity, and repetition are the enemies of true exploration. Starfield is not a mirror to the player, and never could be. Bethesda's game design ethos would never allow it. Once you start looking at the game this way, a lot of the world building falls into place. <sighs> Alright, I've put it off long enough. I owe you examples and specificity. Let's take a dive into the settled systems. A galaxy full of nothing. In its desire to be as non-confrontational as possible, Starfield broke itself in half. A game trying to say, our choices are what make us human, cannot then present such lifeless characters, such a dearth of difficult decisions, and a complete lack of reactivity. Above all else, Starfield is about maintaining the status quo. A game that's nominally about exploration and furthering our understanding of the universe is about keeping everything the same. The one change you can make in the game is the fate of the key a single derelict space station. Everything else is restricted to what passes for ending slides, which are all binary, don't seem to have any real impact on the settled systems, and are guaranteed to be seen less and less as you progress your new game plus. Unity is an ugly, half-hearted concession to actual narrative closure, a vestigial limb sewn onto a bloated monstrosity of a game that desperately wants to be Destiny. However, there was an incredible opportunity in presenting the ending slides like this. Imagine if you were allowed to ask Unity questions about these outcomes, or you were allowed to provide clarification on why you made the decisions you did. That would give the writers so much room to expand on the consequences of your choices, poke at your decision-making process, and make the choices feel more real, more like your own. Instead, there's like two sentences of vague nonsense that doesn't feel like it changed anything at all. Even more aggravating is that these slides are almost entirely tied to the factions, which are some of the most stilted and lifeless groups ever put to code. They have no identity beyond their art direction, and have no beliefs outside their elevator pitch. This is because Starfield is trying as hard as it can to be apolitical. Constellation is apolitical. The News Network is apolitical. Galbank is apolitical. But that's not what that word means. Bethesda, whether through ignorance or malice, is misconstruing politics to mean nationality. The two nations in Starfield, the United Colonies and the Free Star Collective, are just different flavors of American neoliberal capitalism. It's like a version of New Vegas where the epic struggle over the Hoover Dam is between the NCR and the NCR but wearing a cowboy hat. Their right to govern, their method of governance, their ideologies, none are ever explored or even questioned. They say they have different priorities and ideals, but they are functionally identical. The only difference between them is their aesthetics. If that's the intention, if Starfield is trying to say, hey, they're both missing a point, then why is that never discussed? There's a single, woefully short lore tablet pointing out how dumb the colony war was, but in the general, why can't we get along sense. It even points out that there's no reason to have a war over over resources or living space because there's mineral-rich, human-compatible planets everywhere. You can wipe your ass with habitable planets. But this criticism is offered with the wide-eyed naivete that there's so much more out there than playing politics. Except that's insane. Even as a spacefaring race, human beings still have to exist. They will still build societies and cultures which will interact with one another. And that's politics. Some of the best science fiction can be boiled down to exactly that. I can absolutely believe that something like the Colony War might happen in a galaxy of plenty, but justification is never given. No side is given ulterior motives or grievances, legitimate or otherwise. They're not an ideological conflict, there's no population pressures, no competition for resources or living space, nothing. It's supremely dumb, and not in a way that's engaging. The Colony War is a keystone component in the lore of the settled systems, but it isn't more engaging or complex than bashing Firefly and Expanse action figures against each other. None of the NPCs or the factions they belong to have aspirations, culture, or convictions. There isn't a single union in the game. That might have been too close to saying something, and then the player might turn the game off. Can't have that. Did Jeff Bezos write this game? The United Colonies and Freestar Collective are presented with flaws, but ones that are too simple and on the nose to feel authentic. Moreover, nothing about them is revealed or changed throughout the course of the narrative. You can guess their entire shtick the instant you encounter them, and you will always be correct. You'll never be surprised, confronted, or allowed to alter their dynamic. 
The UC is up to some sinister shit, but when you try and call them out on it or screw them over, the game slaps your hand away, because that would change too much. Is not being allowed to reveal that Ve Victus is alive supposed to imply that SSNN isn't as unbiased as they claim, or is it because it changed the status quo too much and require a bunch of extra work for the developer? The answer can only be the latter. They wanted a shocking reveal in one of their quest lines and didn't think about how that might change the overall landscape of the setting. All of the quests are written like this, always resolving in two slightly different, equally acceptable flavors of the pre-existing status quo. As a result of writing the game this way, none of it works. And trying to be so careful and inoffensive, the verisimilitude collapses. Because real people are ideological. They have opinions about how society should be organized, how they want to live their lives, and how their nation should operate. In refusing to portray ideology and actual politics out of a fear of alienating the player, the NPCs and the factions they belong to ring hollow. When they don't have strong feelings about anything, or have strong feelings for poorly established reasons, Reasons, the settled systems fall apart. It can never feel like an authentic place or tell stories that matter because the characters within it don't come across like real people. This inhuman cant is even baked into the dialogue, most visibly when NPCs refer to the factions. This isn't how people talk. This isn't how they think. Factions is an extrinsic word. It's like saying I'm from the United States faction, which is absurd. You can't even use the excuse that it's future slang or whatever because the only person who talks in space slang is this guy. I'm not kidding, it's just him. And being so rabidly apolitical, the opposite is achieved. Starfield is incredibly political, just not in the way sentient thumbs might think. Fucking pronouns! <laughs> However, man-children who think games shouldn't be political and being more inclusive is what makes them political, well, they were already beyond help. No, what makes Starfield political is the refusal to take a stand or provide meaningful commentary outside of a blasé and half-hearted, eh, both sides kind of bad, but not really, I guess. In doing so, it reveals its actual ideology, the one thing it truly believes in. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. The settled systems are the safest, most sterile, and sexless sci-fi universe ever created. It is the Kendall Jenner Pepsi commercial of science fiction. It is terrified of a player having an opinion about it. It wants to hold up a mirror to the player and ask, what do you believe? But the mirror is covered in ads and insane loading screen tips. No, Bethesda, the one bank cannot be apolitical. Constellation can't claim to be apolitical when it is a literal stone throw away from the center of the United Colonies. Because that's not how politics work. That's not how systems work. That's not how people work. I keep arriving at doyless conclusions for every single choice the writers made because those are the only ones that make sense. The United Colonies can never be portrayed too negatively because Constellation is headquartered in New Atlantis and you need to be there for main quest progression. If the UC were too sinister, that raised too many questions about Constellation. Can't have that. The Colony War happened to justify dropping copy-pasted dungeons everywhere. The capital city of an advanced spacefaring society capable of waging interstellar warfare is still in danger from alien fauna somehow because this place needed to have some rustic twang for aesthetic reasons, I guess. This goes on and on. There is one quest in the game that best showcases the flaws inherent to this writing ethos and why this game is so frustrating to talk about. Not only does it perfectly represent how being apolitical means being very political, but because there was some mispotential. First Contact. It's a classic sci-fi setup. After almost 200 years of slower than light travel, a generational colony ship from Old Earth arrives at its destination to find out they've been leapfrogged. FTL was invented while they were in transit, and the paradise planet they've claimed has already been colonized, in this case by a company that built a luxury resort. The colonists don't want to compromise. They filed for settlement rights centuries ago, and feel like they're owed this world in its entirety. The board doesn't want to compromise. They've built a tiny resort on this planet, and they don't want to share a single acre. You're asked to play the role of diplomat and negotiate between the two groups. What this actually involves is telling the colonists to go fuck themselves. Your choices are buying them a grab drive and resources so they can find somewhere else to settle, selling them into indentured servitude, or killing them all. I hope I don't have to tell you why these being the only options is psychotic. Genuinely, what did Bethesda mean by this? You're never given the option to make a real compromise or side with the colonists, even though I feel like the comment about filing paperwork was the perfect setup for a dungeon raid. I thought the game wanted me to go to Earth and dig up their claim, which would have been a great level with lots of opportunities for storytelling. Then you could rub the document in the board's smug faces and give their shitty resort the finger. That would have been a very satisfying ending. In fact, I was so certain this was the intent, I thought my game bugged out and the option to do the dungeon raid was missing. But nope, you have to do whatever the board wants. 
What is the story saying? What is it about? If the intention was to be ironic, that the descendants of the old world's ultra-wealthy are now subordinate to the ultra-wealthy of the settled systems, it falls completely flat. Such a comparison is never examined, and moreover, misses the point when the colonists are normal people who have endured difficult, austere conditions for nearly two centuries. Fucking them over doesn't feel like karma swinging back around, it just feels like being an asshole. If the intent was to be satire, that the board is so comically greedy that they won't share an entire planet they are barely using, that doesn't make any sense because the colonists also refuse to share. For no reason. My brothers in Christ, it is a planet! If the intention was to be depressing, that the board's greed is insurmountable and you can't resolve this quest in the way you might want, that doesn't work either, because that would be the only case of Starfield taking this tone in the entire game. If the quest intended you to feel down, you would have been able to express more sympathy towards the colonists. They would have been more reluctant and depressed if you sold them into servitude, or they were forced to settle elsewhere. Instead, they're fine with either option that leaves them alive because Bethesda doesn't want the player to feel anything. Doing this quest feels like overdosing on crazy pills. There is so much effort poured into custom assets, voice acting, and world building, but no one bothered to check that you could resolve the quest in a way that wasn't completely servile? This is what it means to be apolitical. Paradiso is there, it will always be there, and anyone who might possibly interfere with that can go kick rocks. Again, Starfield is nominally about choices, about exploration and agency and personhood. But you're only ever allowed to watch the story happen in front of you, no matter what that story is saying. You are told the solutions to problems, and then you go do them. The story of every quest doesn't treat you like an active participant, so the decisions you make at their conclusions are arbitrary options presented to you out of obligation, not a real choice that you made. Here's my ending to the Paradiso quest. Hey. But Bethesda says no. They care about their railroaded story and nothing else. You're essentially treated as the loading bar between in-engine cutscenes. If they're gonna hold your hand this much, why offer choices at all? When I say that Starfield doesn't respect the player's agency, this is what I mean. And without a sense of agency, the story's nominal purpose rings hollow. Without real convictions, the game world falls apart. If Starfield was truly invested in being a mirror to the player, they can't just be asked questions. Beliefs have to be explored, reinforced, or challenged with a clear voice. To be meaningful, exploration has to be dangerous, tactile, confronting. Seeing what's out there is only the first half. It's what we learn, what we bring back, and how it changes us that makes it feel substantial. And by design, the settled system systems could never provide that. A more generous eye could write up First Contact as a whiff, one of the side quests that didn't get a ton of drafts and lacked another layer of polish. However, what's inexcusable is that the exact same sins of First Contact are found in every single faction quest. Why am I complaining about the factions when the game is more so about Constellation and the Starborn? Because the vast majority of custom assets, scripting, and gameplay hours are devoted to the faction content, and you are shepherded towards it with all the subtlety of a nuclear bomb. The main quest is barely longer than a single faction quest line, clocking in at around 8 hours. The factional stuff makes up the vast majority of the game's highest effort content. It's also where you'll make the choices the game considers important enough to receive ending slides, so they're fair game. By going over them in a little more detail, I want to illustrate that while each had potential, they all failed for the same reasons. Real quick, I will also offer some tepid praise here and say that at least Bethesda dropped the thing Skyrim and Fallout 4 did, where you always ended up as the faction leader. It never failed to feel incredibly contrived. Anyway, to continue the theme of cowardly, apolitical writing, I want to start with the Freestar Rangers. The quest line is a slurry of common western tropes. Spring and veterans from the big war want revenge on the government, so now they're up to some banditry, but they're secretly doing the bidding of a wealthy industrialist. This CEO, Ron Hope, hired these veterans to harass farmers off their land. He did this so he could turn their farms into mining pits with a special new anti-fertilizer that boosts mineral content in the soil somehow. Apparently, Hope Tech is on the ropes, despite him being rich enough to have a seat in the government, so he had to start this insane and convoluted scheme to cut costs, which ends up seeming way more expensive, time-consuming, and risky than simply selling the anti-fertilizer as its own product. Did the Thieves Guild writer do this one too? Anyway, his stated motivation is that he wants to keep the money rolling in and keep protecting his workers in his company town. Hmm. He has to cut costs, you see, otherwise he'll have to start firing people. Starfield is screaming at me that this dude is a slimy, lying dickhead, and for once we're in agreement. So I confront him with the evidence of his misdeeds, and after his pathetic attempts at a bribe fail, he decides the best course of action is to start shooting me. Me, a man who he knows just massacred an entire base full of hardened, vengeful, well-equipped colony war veterans. It goes as well as you'd expect. 
The game then tries to backpedal, being all, well, well, he did so much for Hopetown. No, no, he didn't, Sam. That was the whole fucking point. So, why am I harping on about this? Well, because they were so close to sticking the landing. Imagine instead if Ron Hope realized he was backed against the wall and decided to surrender. He could have feigned regret, let himself be cuffed. And then he could have used his wealth and connections to avoid any sort of consequences whatsoever. That would have been an ending. Sure, you could construe this as the game not being reactive, but I think the storytelling benefits would have been worth it. That ending would have said so much more about who Ron Hope is, the flaws of the Freestar Collective, and the role of the Rangers within it. The quest could have ended with you sitting in the rock with your fellow Rangers, sipping a beer and feeling a little shitty. But at least you would have felt something. As I've established though, that wasn't an option. The player can't be confronted with anything that feels too real or, god forbid, political, so the actual ending to the quest line is absurd nonsense. The whole quest lets you make flavorful choices about what kind of lawman you want to be, and it comments on some of the roleplaying you did along the way, and then the story eats shit on the finishing line. This is the exact same problem with the best quest line in the game, the UC Vanguard. I was being a little reductive when I said it boils down to, hey, remember aliens, but I still stand by that. Regardless, I think this one's competent. It dives into the history of the UC and the settled systems, planting plenty of foreshadowing with fun payoffs later. It has decent quest variety and some of the game's more memorable characters. It even has a final mission with some real energy to it. It's still riddled with Bethesda writing tropes. The character motivations and plotting are pretty thin, flat, or nonsensical, but at least it was dumb fun sci-fi schlock. Just a couple issues. Vevictus being the one behind all the Terramorph attacks is very silly. He's so obviously villainous, I thought the game was setting him up as a red herring. The real twist is that it was that straightforward. So I ask, what if it wasn't him? What if it was President Lady? By changing some character motivations and a couple of plot details around, you could tell a much more meaningful story than insane megalomaniac does a terrorism. If it was President Lady, Bethesda could have shown that the United Colonies aren't improving because the flawed authoritarian system the nation is built upon can only produce flawed authoritarian leaders. President Lady might have wanted to further centralize and control the United Colonies, so she orchestrated terrifying unpredictable attacks to justify increasing the power of her state security apparatuses. She has the perfect scapegoat in Ve Victus, and the player would have no reason to believe him if he insisted on his innocence. She could have played this off exactly how she does in the real story, where she sees him as a relic of a darker time for the UC and executes him for real this time, her hands clean of wrongdoing. Imagine how fucking cold it would have been if she confessed to being the real mastermind at the end. Enjoy your citizenship, live with the consequences. That would have been an awesome twist. Instead, the attacks were orchestrated by a vengeful, sociopathic war criminal mastermind from a secret prison cell because that's more comfortable and less real to the player than having to reconcile that they might have been working for the bad guys. Starfield doing service guarantees citizenship, but not engaging with what that means is monstrously gross. It's like they wanted to plop down a pop sci-fi reference and didn't stop to think about how that'd affect the world building. It's like they took Starship Troopers at face value. It's important to note here that this isn't me wanting more depressing questline resolutions because that's more realistic or political or whatever. Hell no. These quests could have been written in ways where the player can avoid these bad outcomes by rewarding critical thinking and clever choices. That way, if you put in the work and pay attention, you'll feel like you, the player, accomplished a goal or made a meaningful choice. Then, the stories can actually be about something and be fun, instead of mindlessly following a quest marker to the next quick hit of dopamine. As it stands, the Vanguard questline ends with, Congratulations, you're such a good boy, you get Suffrage Prime. Ugh. The Sysdef and Crimson Fleet quest line does have some reactivity, but this one's broken on a more fundamental level. First things first, the hook for this quest is Deranged Moon Logic. If you do a naughty and get caught, Dollar Store Cisco shanghais you, a random criminal, into his incredibly sensitive undercover operation to take down the Crimson Fleet, the largest and most well-organized pirate mafia in the settled systems. It doesn't matter what you were arrested for. You could have been picking up letter or being an actual pirate, but no matter what, you're the one for the job. You can get this quest through the Vanguard quest line, but I'm betting this is how most players encountered it. In any case, you join the Crimson Fleet. They're a fun, scrappy group with some real camaraderie, and there's more to them than they let on. Sorry, that was a blatant lie. No, they're irritating edgelords who are trying way too hard to be badass. Jazz was alright, I guess. I'm getting ahead of myself. The whole point of this quest is to ingratiate yourself with the Crimson Fleet while collecting, or failing to collect, evidence for Sysdef. This means getting to know the Crimson Fleet captains, and I think I would rather rip my fingernails off with rusty wire strippers than be around any of them for a second longer than I absolutely have to. 
They're the worst. They're every amateur writer's idea of badasses. Violent, hyper-aggressive psychopaths who swagger around with unearned arrogance and kill each other over scraps. They're not badasses, they're pathetic. Every attempt to characterize them otherwise falls flat. They don't think or act like real people. Like, take Rokov. He got kicked out of the Crimson Fleet, an organization that normally kills you for leaving, and managed to become the captain of a luxury cruise liner. And now he wants to flush a steady, well-paying job in conditions like these down the drain so he can go back to being a scuzzy loser in a decrepit fuck barn? What? The quest line expects you to build rapport with these people. If you side with the Crimson Fleet, they all show up at the end, smugging about the good old days and lending a hand. If you betray them, you gotta be the one to put them down. That'd be a great way to end the quest if I cared about them or they believed in anything. At the very least, this is the one quest with any real reactivity to it. Betraying the Crimson Fleet means the key will be emptied or destroyed. In actual consequence, because there was a dense cluster of vendors that you could sell your loot to. But that's as far as it goes. The bigger problem is that there's no real player agency in this quest. The Sistef questline is huge and sprawling, loaded with NPCs, scripted scenarios, and one of my favorite levels in the game. But since Starfield is so terrified you'll miss it, it shreds its own verisimilitude to pieces to ensure that you won't. There's an opportunity here to do something interesting. If you're a dedicated space cop, the quest could be over the instant you docked at the key. Even at lower levels, you can kill every single pirate inside, including Delgado, without too much trouble. Quest over. But that would mean not seeing all the content, missing out on Crix's legacy, and all the credits it contains. And that would be awesome! That'd be real, meaningful agency. Whether out of impatience or bloodthirst, you could have screwed yourself out of tons of content. Sure, that sucked the first time, but isn't this game meant to be replayed? What happens if the next time through, you go along with it? That'd be an incredible realization. On that note, Akande tells you to avoid hurting innocent people while you're undercover, except you're never put in danger of actually doing so. Non-lethal options are plentiful, easy, and clearly signposted. You're never confronted with a tough choice that might endanger the mission, or ever pressed on who you are or why you want to join the Crimson Fleet. At least Akande will fire you if you get too into the role. That's nice, but you can still finish the rest of the quest line with the Crimson Fleet, so you don't miss out on doing Crix's legacy. As it is, even if you side with Sistef and surrender Crix's legacy like a nerd, you still get the exact same amount of credits as if you sided with the pirates, because god forbid something of consequence happens. Whichever side you choose, the game does its best to make sure you don't feel anything. If you slaughtered the Crimson Fleet, who cares, because they sucked. If you betrayed Sistef, who cares, because they're vaguely authoritarian jerks who shanghaied you into this mess in the first place for insane reasons. Killing them doesn't even add bounty to the United Colonies. Awful. If I sound frustrated, the next faction is so so much worse. If first contact made me feel like I was downing fistfuls of crazy pills, the Ryujin Industries quest line made me feel like I was mainlining weapons-grade PCP. The plot is pretty simple. Climb the corporate ladder, go from getting coffee to performing industrial espionage. As a corporate operative, you're tasked with infiltrating various companies, stealing, planning evidence, even breaking into Ryujin itself to ferret out a mole. The NPCs are playing every cyberpunk trope to the hilt with snide relish, engaging in betrayals, sabotage, and shady deals at every step of the way. That sounds like fun and it can be at points. However, the writing for this quest is brain damage levels of baffling, because the game only lets you be a Ryujin stooge, a mercenary out for the paycheck, or a boy scout, impotently wagging your finger at all the vile shit going down. You can betray several characters as you climb the corporate ladder, but you can never betray Ryujin itself. Even when it's revealed the product they want you to steal back from a rival corp is a mind control device. Ryujin developed a mind control device, called it Project Dominion, then planned to use it to become the most powerful entity in the settled system. Systems. They were going to sell both the device itself and a secondary device that shields you from its effects, making anyone too poor to afford either essentially mind slaves. And then Starfield has the balls to try and frame Ryujin as the lesser evil just because they're not speedrunning human trials? Are you for real? That's where the line gets drawn? I feel like I'm being pranked. Corporate culture may have its ugly side, but that doesn't mean we've lost our humanity. This. This has to be a joke, right? Is this a jab at Elon Musk and his monkey murdering machine? There's no way you're supposed to take this at face value. Except I think you are, because you're never allowed to express the opinion, hey, this is super fucked up and Ryujin needs to be burned to the ground. At the very most, you can convince the other board members to shelve the mind control device. That's it. Hell, right before the questline ends, you can rat on a rival corp to SSNN for stealing this technology, but you can't also choose to tattle on Ryujin, even though you have ample evidence of what they're up to. Are you supposed to feel like a monster at the end of this questline? I'll never know, because the questline bugged out at the very end, and I couldn't finish it. I had to look up what happens instead, because fuck doing this insane quest ever again. 
It's been said that you have to meet Bethesda games halfway, that they're sandboxes. You have to use your imagination, make your own fun, and commit to your roleplay to get the most out of them. That you can be whoever you want within these massive fictional worlds. I disagree. This is my response to that, because this is as much freedom as Bethesda will allow. This is the most role-playing the Ryujin quest line will actually tolerate. It's petty and juvenile and stupid, but pretending the game's letting you do something vulgar and rebellious is as close you can get to meaningfully expressing yourself. If the Ryujin quest line is intended as satire, then so is Gallagher. Vaguely placating the player's sensibilities by trying to frame Ryujin as the lesser evil when they were plotting to build a mind-control device shows where the concern actually lay. Bethesda wanted to have a fun, over-the-top cyberpunk questline about backstabby corporate espionage and didn't want the player to feel too bad doing it. There was no thought given to what the player might think about the actual text of the story or how they might want to affect it. I can't read this as satire. It's too dumb. This is why I said I didn't just want depressing endings. What I want is more agency within a real story that has something to say. The good ending to this quest, betraying Ryujin and quitting, is right there, but it's not a choice you're allowed to make. Now hold on, Gun. I can hear you saying, why are you whining about factions and politics and agency and stuff when the main quest is more about the big ideas? Well, you already know my feelings on that, but I should address its issues anyway because, like I said, the entire thrust of the narrative, becoming Starborn, breaks everything else in the game. The first and most important thing the story says is, don't worry, this universe exists to cater to you. You're given a ship for no good reason because Barrett's such a wacky guy, then you do the tutorial and are granted membership in Gentrified Starfleet. The artifacts are nebulous nothing burgers, and the characters leap to insane conclusions about what they are and what they might do. We'll talk more about the characters in a second, but for now, it's made clear that even though this is your first day, you're the one running the show. It's frustrating that modern Bethesda games are so desperate to rush you into the power fantasy where you're the center of a attention and the only character that matters. It foils any attempt to immerse yourself in the fiction because it feels like the universe is bending itself backwards to make you the hero. This might also just be a personal thing, but I feel like the game is patronizing me. That if it's not putting me front and center from the word go, my fragile ego won't be able to take it and my attention will waver. The game doesn't trust its own storytelling or mechanics to hook you, so it embarks upon a series of contrivances to make you feel like the most important person ever. That's what the opening hour of Starfield is telling me. That it doesn't trust my agency, that it doesn't have confidence confidence in itself, and its universe exists to make me feel like protagonist man with magic space powers. Providing a power fantasy like that is what video games can excel at, but starting you off at the top leaves nowhere for the story to go. Mechanically you might become more powerful, but narratively the story is over after the tutorial. And that's the first hour! The deeper issue with the main quest being about gathering artifacts is that the mystery surrounding them is surface level. What are they made of? Who made them? What are they for? The characters discuss these questions and talk about how exciting it is to be pushing the boundaries of our scientific understanding, but structuring your quest this way immediately conveys to the player that the artifacts are nothing more than MacGuffins. Constellation is supposed to be an organization that explores and discovers, but what you actually do is go where the eye says and then get the artifact that is always there. If it wasn't for the eye, the main quest would be impossible to complete. There is no exploration and going to a place to find a thing, finding the thing, then repeating the process. Starfield's main quest was a brutal victim of and-then storytelling the flattest and least engaging way to tell a story imaginable. You find an artifact, and then you find another, and then you find another, and then you buy one, and then you get another, and then the Starborn attack, and then you go find more artifacts, then you build the armillary, then you become Starborn. The purpose of the main quest is not to explore the final frontier or push scientific boundaries, but to show off points of interest in the settled systems and urge you towards the faction quests. It takes you to different places, and you encounter some obstacles along the way, but the story is only ever, get the artifacts. The Starborn are supposed to be a mid-game twist, a mysterious new threat that shakes up the status quo, but think about it. What does their arrival actually change? If you've been playing the game in the way Bethesda intended and biting the quest hooks like they clearly want you to, the Starborn are complete pushovers. They fight you like every other enemy in the game, bark out generic villain dialogue, and then die like bitches. And then the hunter kills one of your companions. This is supposed to ramp up the stakes and make the main quest feel more personal, but it comes off as predictable, arbitrary, and desperate. As soon as they had you help out your friends on the eye, I knew someone was getting murked. This isn't a consequence of your decisions or your pursuit of the artifacts, it's a naked grab for emotional investment. And again, it doesn't change the story, it just subtracts a character. Still gotta go find those artifacts, bucko, so get on it. The Hunter is apparently ruthless enough to attack Constellation to get the artifacts, but he never does so again for the rest of the game, nor does he stop you from trying to acquire more. At the end of the game, you can even convince him to abandon his pursuit with the Radiant Dialogue minigame. 
I love the idea of being able to talk down the main villains of a game, but this feels unearned. There was no indication before this that the Hunter or the Emissary were ever going to desist in their quest. They talk about novelty amidst the multiverse being a factor, but it's empty cruft because that relies on external factors you have no control over. You don't convince the Starborn that their point of view is wrong or that you deserve the artifacts, you're attempting to convince them that they're bored and should stop. And it works. The Starborn's motivations are so nebulous and ill-defined that subverting them feels less like convincing them of something and more like you caught them while their brains were rebooting. Once again, reaching a doyless conclusion, I feel like the speech option was there to have a speech option, not because it's an important part of the story being told. So you can kill them instead and they die in seconds, which sucks. The level of threat the Starborn pose is never explored because they're as powerful as the story needs them to be at any given moment. Defeating them doesn't feel earned, it just feels like the game is finally allowing you to win. And then you become Starborn. Again, it's interesting that they contextualize New Game Plus as part of the main quest, but issues arise once you start thinking about it. Having your story being about the multiverse to facilitate perpetual play is fine, but it's impossible to meaningfully explore the concept of alternate universes within the scope of a Bethesda game, especially one as massive as Starfield. Rewarding the player for doing New Game Plus again and again and again forces the player to acknowledge that each alternate universe only has cosmetic differences. Doing so directly guides them towards the conclusion that the game wants them to keep playing forever, but nothing will change and no decision will matter, so why bother? Actually, hasn't the whole game been about how becoming Starborn makes you cold, unfeeling, and patronizing? Was that the intention? With how much emphasis the narrative puts on your human connections, I don't think that was the case. The main quest is about becoming an immensely powerful being that is the center of the universe, except that's just the default premise of a Bethesda RPG. All the implied grandeur in a multiverse stuff doesn't convince me this was a story worth telling. It engages with a writing trope that I personally despise and can be found across countless science fiction and fantasy stories, the avalanche of proper nouns. In Starfield, you have to defeat the Starborn to get the artifact to build the armillary to reach unity. This isn't inherently bad writing or anything. Fictional universes need their own constructed concepts and interior logic to function. The issue is that writers tend to hit the shift key when they want their story to feel more lofty and important without laying the groundwork to earn that grandeur. By talking up these proper nouns in hushed, wistful tones, they're trying to get the audience to care about their story faster. How can you not care about the thing? It's the thing! It wasn't enough that Earth was destroyed, it also had to be a big, dramatic, binary choice. This feels incredibly jarring in Starfield. The art direction is screaming hard science fiction, a genre where science is treated with enthusiasm and respect, while the story feels like a generic fantasy novel about hunting down magical MacGuffins, and the gameplay is trying to be Fallout 4, it just confuses things even further. The the actual grandeur doesn't have room to exist within this tangled mess of directions. All the proper nouns and production value in the world can't make following a quest marker for some multiverse MacGuffins feel like real exploration. If the intention is that it's not the big ideas that matter, it's humanity itself, the people we meet and the connections we form, Starfield also falls flat in its face. As I discussed in both the Skyrim and Mass Effect videos, sometimes the story's characters, even if they're a vehicle for a subpar plot, can be engaging enough to keep a narrative afloat. This is why I consider characters to be the most important component of a story. If there's no one to latch onto, identify with, or care about, your entire narrative is dead in the water. I don't care what happens to these people are the eight deadly words, as coined by sci-fi critic Dorothy J. Haight, and they apply to Starfield and Spades. The game at least tries. They put in the work to give the main companions and supporting cast personalities, backstories, and character arcs. They talk differently, their requests are built around core themes, and they're intended to give deeper insight into the three primary factions. This is how companions and RPGs should be written. However, by structuring the main quest around Constellation, an organization designed to be as agreeable as possible, they don't feel distinct outside their character concept and can't develop past it. Although there are five companion characters, they're all reduced to different flavors of Constellation. Sarah's the leader, Sam's a space cowboy, Barrett holds up Sporks, Andreja's a smuggler, and Vasco's your true neutral robot. Although most of them are intended to highlight the different factions in the settled systems, they're a part of Constellation, an apolitical organization that the player must always feel welcome at, so they don't have any strong feelings about anything. The intention seems to be that they're trying to be Starfleet in a galaxy that doesn't care about exploration. Instead, this comes off as them being smuggled 
smugly callous towards all the problems in the settled systems. Sarah's a veteran of the colony war and gets sad about it, but she doesn't have any strong feelings about the United Colonies beyond bureaucracy bad, I guess. Sam is a descendant of the founder of the Free Star Collective, but doesn't have any thoughts about that outside his daddy issues. Barrett lost his husband in the colony war, but doesn't have any strong feelings about the UC, the Free Star Collective, or the war itself. Andresia is part of the reclusive house Varun, but doesn't have anything to say about it. You can't even ask her questions about her beliefs because there aren't any answers. Not in a hand wavy, faith doesn't have concrete answers kind of way, but in the it's just a wacky space cult bro, don't think about it kind of way. She would have been the perfect insight into the history, culture, and beliefs of House Faroon, but she doesn't have anything to say about them that you can't infer from their mural in the Vanguard hallway. Do you know why the Zealots use lots of disabling weapons? It's because their population is plummeting, so they're kidnapping and enslaving the people of the settled systems to bring back to their home planet. You didn't know that because I made it up. It's such an obvious conclusion to reach that makes them even more sinister and interesting, but it was never even hypothesized within the game. I'm left with the impression that confirming a detail that vile would have made the player feel something, so it got the axe. Guess they use more disabling guns because they're more sci-fi or whatever. Sorry to harp on about Andresia and House Varun so much. She feels like the least constellation-y character, so I thought they were going to take her in interesting directions and realize the potential RPG companions can provide. Instead, she was betrayed by her people for vague reasons and feels whatever about it. How are we supposed to care about any of these people? They're all written to be nice and charming in their own ways, but nothing besides that. They don't feel like real people who have inner lives, they feel like Marvel characters. On that note, Starfield even feels like an MCU entry, because the setting and the characters that fill it are so sexless and unhorny that it's like the galaxy is populated exclusively by monastic robots. Just one more way Bethesda sanded down their game to be as safe and inoffensive as possible. As a result, the concession to market expectations for romance in RPGs comes off as exactly that, strange and obligatory. The only person who's allowed to be sexual in Starfield is the player and their chosen NPC. This means they make a sophomore comment after sliding off your bed fully clothed and providing you with an emotional security buff. It's so unnatural and off-putting, I'd rather they didn't provide the option at all. I wouldn't like that either, but this is worse somehow. Sexuality is a part of human existence, and Bethesda refused to engage with it to avoid controversy and pursue maximum profit potential. I find this cowardly. But beyond the obvious Doyleist reasons for this choice, it has a much more damning problem. None of the characters feel real as a result. Since the companions are the only four characters in the settled systems that are allowed to be sexual, and only then at the player's behest, it's one more strange flaw to add to the pile of other reasons they don't feel like human beings. The tragedy here is that there was clearly a titanic level of effort involved in creating them. They have thousands of lines, they're reactive to story beats, they comment on specific locations, and discuss quest conclusions with you. But since they were all confined by Starfield sterile writing ethos, they are devoid of life. All of the talented performances were wasted. Like I said, they even got me with Sarah at the memorial. However, even when she died, the most the game could get out of me was an... Oh no! Anyway... This is perhaps the most subjective part of what is already a very subjective video, but I cannot be asked to care about these characters. Maybe I'm just a callous asshole. If you played the game, did you find them engaging? I don't know. In comparison, Sila isn't even the best character in the rest of the Righteous, but I have more to say about her than I do about any character in the entirety of Starfield. And this goes beyond the companions. I only focused on them because they're so central to the narrative. There are a handful of interesting side characters in Starfield, some that are fun to hate and some that feel like real people, but they are few and far between. None of them are interesting enough to make the rest of the game worth experiencing. When broken down into its constituent elements, Starfield's story doesn't work. When viewed as a whole, it's even worse. For all its talk about exploration, the multiverse, choices, consequences, and human connection, I never believed a word of it. In being so non-confrontational and taking whatever path would make the player feel the most okay about everything, the settled systems were broken beyond repair. The faction quest lacking any meaningful choices or resolutions robs the setting of texture and depth. The primary characters being slightly different flavors of constellation robs the setting of vibrancy and humanity. Reducing the story of humans reaching the center of the multiverse down to a series of linear fetch quests interconnected with lifeless and then writing so the game can concoct a diegetic reason for New Game Plus was a remarkably awful choice. Doing so is clearly telegraphing that the Hunter, the avatar of disengaged doyless nihilism of treating this game like a toy and not a work of art, is ultimately correct. You know, this dude. 
the bad guy. You even get his armor if you do New Game Plus 10, so that means this was intentional. This is neither commentary nor irony. This is the game telling you to treat it like a solipsistic time waster in the same breath it wants to say it's deep and meaningful. It's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! The most natural, meaningful conclusion of the story, rejecting unity to make the most out of the one life you have, is at odds with the obviously intended conclusion of embracing it. These two options are not given the same narrative or mechanical weight. Even if you do reject it, you're allowed to go back whenever you want, which means that there's only one real option. Rejecting unity isn't embracing your humanity and mortality, you're just kicking the apotheosis can down the road a little. You can turn the game off after rejecting unity, but nothing else in the game is designed with that intention in mind. The only thing Starfield says with conviction is keep playing forever. This might be one of the biggest stories ever told. The artifact gave the scientists a greater understanding of time and space. I acknowledge that I'm a hypercritical asshole when it comes to video game writing, and that what I'm looking for in that department is different than most. However, I never expected Bethesda to cater their $100 million AAA product specifically to snobs like me, because that's ridiculous. So why am I even bitching about this? Why am I complaining about Starfield's writing if it was intended as a generic space adventure with a generic setting and a generic repeatable story? What did I expect? Well, I try to look at games holistically, because that's how they work. Story, gameplay, art direction, each of them affects the other, you must understand this. Even if one aspect of game development isn't a priority, it still has an effect on the stuff that is. If the writing had been good, or at the very least competent, everything else about Starfield would have been elevated. What's particularly frustrating is that, like I said, sometimes you do get glimpses of something amazing. But then it crushes them under mountains of bad, or simply meh. Instead of enhancing the game, Starfield's writing hits the point of story collapse an hour into the game. Questions pile up thick and fast until you hit a point where something happens that's so dumb you take a step back and realize everything is broken. This is what I mean when I say Starfield doesn't respect your intelligence. It's so terrified of offering an opinion it doesn't spend any time justifying itself. The world building itself is focused on player retention, yet it melts under scrutiny because that's all it cares about. In comparison, Vardenfell is a volcanic alien hellhole full of racist elf wizards, but it feels so much more like a real place because considerable thought was put into how people would live there and what their society would look like. You can get immersed. If you're not invested in the settled systems and its stories, everything about Starfield is lessened. Instead, you have to lean on the gameplay to carry the experience and, uh, who oh boy. Even if you approach Starfield as a game that you can turn your brain off with, it fails on pretty much every level. Interacting with Starfield's gameplay systems is an endlessly confounding and painful process. I'll remind you of the Field of Rakes analogy because it's just so accurate. Nothing about Starfield's gameplay works because in its maximalist aim to do everything and be everything, it does nothing well. Whenever I'm enjoying something about Starfield, another gameplay design philosophy fucking jumps me out of nowhere and takes my lunch money. The end result is a game that is actively hostile to its own design directives because it gets less fun the more you play it and learn how it works. The Bethesda RPG is something of a genre unto itself, and like I said in the intro, it's so close to being something incredible that they keep suckering us in. After all, when the formula works, it results in some of the best games of all time. The basic premise is that you explore an open world, find problems, overcome them, and grow stronger, increasing your character's capabilities, wealth, and your own mastery of the game's systems. In doing so, you learn more about the story, you encounter more complex and challenging problems, while finding more interesting places to explore that uncover even more narrative. Over the years, Bethesda has experimented with this formula, tweaking it to achieve different goals. As they've become one of the largest and most profitable AAA studios in the industry, this translates into simplifying their gameplay mechanics until they take no mental effort to engage with, out of sheer mortal terror that one of their customers might have to think about what an attribute point is. This is ridiculous for reasons I've already covered. What makes Starfield's take on the Bethesda RPG interesting, and incredibly flawed, is that it's a blend of previous titles and their own interpretations of that formula. More than any other game, Starfield is intended to feel and play like Fallout 4. Like Fallout 4, it pursues the goal of perpetual play. Just like the storytelling, none of the gameplay systems are very complex, nothing is challenging, nothing confronts the player or makes them think. You engage with the core gameplay loop, explore, kill, loot, explore, until you're too tired to continue. 
it is a much, much more streamlined version of the classic dungeon crawl experience, which they nearly perfected with Daggerfall back in 96. In Daggerfall, there are a handful of handcrafted locations with important characters and quest givers scattered around an enormous yet empty map. They direct the player towards randomly generated dungeons, and by overcoming the challenges therein, you loot the place down to the bedrock. You head back to town, sell your ill-gotten gains, upgrade your gear, and grow more powerful. With Starfield having procedurally generated planets interspersed by loading screens, radiant quests, and some large handcrafted locations crammed with named NPCs, the game feels remarkably similar to Daggerfall. You are often pointed to a location where there'll be some bandits in one of four flavors, you shoot them, you loot them, you fly back home. What it's lacking is Daggerfall's challenge. <laughs> On top of this, Starfield also takes a stab at being an honest-to-god role-playing game like Obsidian's New Vegas, with a focus on world-building, choices, characters, consequences. It has a sprawling skill tree, more varied quest types, and avenues for player agency and expression. You might be seeing the problem. These three types of games are not inherently incompatible, but they are difficult to cohere. They have different structures, different priorities, and reward engaging with the game differently. Personally, I find the problems lie with the perpetual play style of game design, the Fallout 4 style. Like its predecessor, Starfield treats you like an annoying toddler that needs an iPad, giving you an avalanche of tiny dopamine hits to keep you playing. And whenever I get a whiff of grinding that a game isn't respecting my time, I drop it like a hot rock. If a game is intended to be played over many, many hours, it must, by necessity, tease out its systems, its progression, its rewards, and any story it might have over the longest possible stretch of time. The only conclusion I can come to is that it's not worth it. I can understand and appreciate why MMOs and ARPGs are built like this, they can serve as fantastic social spaces, but why a single player RPG? It's been said by myself and countless others before me that Bethesda is terrified of telling its players no because they think they're interfering with that fantasy of going anywhere and doing anything by doing so. But this has the opposite effect. By telling me I can go anywhere and do anything, the actual scope of what I can do is diminished by raw necessity. Providing meaningful content for every kind of gameplay style is impossible on such a massive scale. Therefore, the only recourse, if you're so scared of saying no, is to do it all badly by cramming everything into this ill-fitting ARPG model. More damningly is that this core design directive means Bethesda can't also tell its players yes. They can't reward players for lateral thinking, making a dedicated build, or learning the game's systems. It can't establish replay value by passing out a reactive narrative or meaningful quest lines, which means that their stories have to be empty, vapid, and without consequence by design fiat. Therefore, without any form of pushback, there's no way for the game to provide real stakes or a sense of achievement. There's only the grind. It's not that I'm impatient, either. Some of my favorite games are ones that take a long time to get going in terms of the player's power arc. But in those games, reaching the end of that arc feels like a real reward. In Starfield, it feels like the game is arbitrarily dropping roadblocks in my way to keep me from making the rest of the grind too easy. Let me explain. Early in my first playthrough, I got jumped in a high-level system by a squadron of spacer ships. I had to use asteroids for cover as I picked off the weaker ones until I could take a crack at the big one. It was a huge ship, clearly outclassing me. I was almost blown up myself, but after burning through my repair kits, I was able to disable and board it. A brutal CQC fight ensued. They drained most of my ammo and the health packs that I'd been saving up for hours, but I managed to do it. The ship was mine. I went up to the pilot seat to claim my prize. Nope. I wasn't allowed to fly it because I needed to invest some arbitrary skill points first. Starfield didn't want to tell me yes. It doesn't even really let you sell the captured ships you can fly. After commandeering a ship, you have to register it for a huge percentage of its total value before you're allowed to sell it. This means you can make more money selling a handful of guns than you can being a badass space pirate. This is also why all the vendors have so few credits between them, to discourage the player from selling all their loot at once. The loot that the game is built around procuring. Credits are so useful for everything in Starfield that it doesn't want you to acquire them too quickly. So instead, you have to do the settled system shuffle, going from planet to planet to planet, wasting your time because you dared to engage with the gameplay systems as they were designed. Otherwise, it'd break the progression curve. Even if you do save up a bunch of credits, the game doesn't allow you to spend them in the ways that you want. I love the shipbuilding system, but I couldn't engage with it until I ground out more skill points and inane challenges by installing and uninstalling random bits. Because if I didn't have to do that, that'd be another way to break the ship combat. 
By the time you reach the end of the intended progression curve, where you can build or fly the most powerful ships, nothing you do with them will feel like an accomplishment. You don't get to enjoy having an awesome spaceship because using it feels like bullying now. You'd mastered the ship combat hours ago. This is just the game patting you on the head for spending so much time grinding. The game systems are so simple, the game has to take away functionality to turn them into skills. It doesn't feel like getting better at anything, you're just being allowed to suck less. Attempting to integrate actual RPG mechanics into this Fallout 4 style game design philosophy is functionally impossible because the game does not and cannot have any investment in them. It wants you to do all of the content forever, so it can't structure itself around character specialization, narrative decisions, or systems mastery. But why am I complaining about that when Starfield was explicitly designed as an action RPG? Because the action isn't fun. Look, I'd be lying if I said that the gunplay isn't at least decent. That's not the problem. The problem is that there is nothing else. Guns, ballistics in particular, are so powerful, numerous, and easy to use that using anything else is pointless. There are so many other skills focused on combat, and they're all ancillary. Investing into martial arts or melee weapons isn't adhering to a character concept, it's just being a contrarian. I started this game on its highest difficulty setting, very hard, and I never turned it off. The worst it got was annoying. At the beginning, when I found the right weapons and faced the right enemies, the game felt pretty good. The weapons felt powerful, and gormlessly standing out in the open got me killed. This didn't last long. Once I got five or six levels, Starfield became incredibly easy. I didn't even invest into stealth until I was level 30 or so because it wasn't necessary. The ammo system is a speed bump. You're so flush with ammo a few hours in that you'll never need to worry about it again, even when you do hit the occasional bullet sponge. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that I'm bragging or engaging in get good ass hattery. Truth be told, I'm very, very bad at video games. However, I still enjoy playing games on harder difficulties because that should force me to use all the tools at my disposal. The issue is that Starfield doesn't have or need tools beyond shoot the bad men until they fall down. It's serviceable, but that's all it ever is. Once you learn that guns go blam and jetpacks go whoosh, you've mastered Starfield's combat. The only thing magic space powers do is make the game even easier. The game is so large and action-focused that combat needed depth, complexity, challenge, or variety to remain engaging. There's no other way to keep such a titanic game interesting over its intended lifespan. Instead, for the overwhelming majority of your time with Starfield, the core gameplay loop, the action in your action RPG, is mindless, repetitive mush. Your fifth hour with the game looks identical to the 50th. The only real difference between very easy and very hard is how much ammo you use. Better loot and flat skill increases don't make you better at the game, they just make your numbers go up. Without anything deeper to learn about the combat system, there's no reward for engaging with it. No challenges, no discoveries, no twists or shakeups. I've seen people trying to play this game like Dishonored, but to that I offer this classic bit. Dancing around like this is wasting your time. It's cool you can do this, of course, but it's never necessary, nor is it encouraged. It's only possible at all because of borked AI and stealth mechanics. If the game was intended to play like this, it would be the most optimal way to play the game. Instead, when the game is this simple, it forces enemy variety, AI, and level design to carry the combat experience. Because a simple yet smooth combat system can stay interesting if the enemies and environments encountered have enough variety. This will force the player to adopt different playstyles or tactics as they progress Progress. Starfield doesn't do this. The reason is space bandits. You'll be shooting so many goddamn space bandits. They dress them up in different costumes, call them different things, but they all use the exact same brain-dead AI. Even the Starborn, interdimensional beings of immense power from alternate universes, fight like every other human opponent in the game. Alien fauna are no different. Some burrow, some spit, some slash, but the actual differences I found between them were the size of their hitboxes and health bars. Terramorphs are supposed to be these horrible mind-bending predators, but they're just bullet sponges. I think this is why I enjoyed the two Zero-G dungeons so much. I love Zero-G maneuvering in games, and although I never expected Starfield to be boundary, it's woefully underutilized. It's a twist in the typical Bethesda combat experience that provides some much-needed variety. The physics are great, the guns kick you back a little, fun stuff. But the areas designed around Zero-G can be counted on one hand. The instant they're over, it's back to playing Fallout 4 in space. There's ship combat too, but I've already described to you the only tactic you'll ever have to employ. Starfield ship combat can be boiled down to a DPS check. Shoot the bad guy first, spam repair if you take damage, win. All of those ship parts, weapons, shields, engines, and the effort it took to make it all work together, all in service of a DPS check. I wasn't expecting this game to be a space sim like Star Citizen or Elite Dangerous or anything, but it's still too basic to feel worthwhile. 
At least the effects and production value are outstanding. Weapons carving into enemy hulls, ships breaking apart in a shower of sparks, it all looks fantastic. But the flying doesn't feel good, and the combat is extremely simple, so all of this feels wasted. Once you finally do spend the skill points on ship design, you get access to the particle beams, and then you never have to think about space combat again. That shouldn't feel like a relief, but it does. Whether in space or on the ground, if your combat system is built so they want to get it out of the way as fast as possible, that is a bad combat system. When I say Starfield doesn't respect your time, this is what I mean. Ideally, a game will reward you for learning its systems, experimenting with its tools, and understanding what it asks of you. The time you invest in it will be rewarded with a sense of tangible progress and achievement. Starfield wants you to spend forever playing it, but also can't be too slow to get going, so it gives you the most basic and effective tools right at the start, never evolves from that, and asks you to use them in the exact same way endlessly. Your reward for playing the game is to play the game the exact same way, but slightly faster, and I can't help but find that boring. Another reason I'm so confident this game is intended to waste your time is the loot. Once more, it goes back to that perpetual play game design. If your game has simpler skill trees in combat, finding a new shiny thing is a great way to peck that button and get some corn. The weapons are designed like ARPG drops, complete with color coding, randomized properties, and prefixes that affect their performance. This feels indescribably awful when it's welded onto a single-player RPG template. There are unique items, but they're never as good as something that has the right prefix. For some reason, the hunter gave me a special laser rifle after he blapped Sarah, and it was worse than a plain pistol I picked up a couple hours into the game, because that had a better prefix. Some of the best moments in RPGs can be finding a powerful item that changes the way you play or expands your tool set. Not in Starfield. Gotta keep grinding and grinding until you find the exact thing you're looking for. However, none of the weapons are really fun or interesting enough to justify using them over something that does more damage. Because you're doing so much combat, using anything less than the most optimal and efficient equipment is the best way to any percent your way into a migraine. You can modify your weapons too, but um, wow. The game's crafting system is a hot dog water and gym sock sandwich with a side of fried toenail clippings. First, you have to spend crafting materials at a research bench to gain access to weapon modifications, spacesuit adjustments, and fancier chairs for your settlement. However, these are broken up into tiers, so you first have to invest valuable skill points into upgrading your crafting skills. But wait! Before you're allowed to actually spend the skill point, you have to complete a crafting challenge by installing mods or building outpost shit, wasting more resources each time, after which point then you can upgrade the relevant crafting skill so you can spend more resources researching the project you want to craft so you can spend more resources to finally craft the mod. I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein, and I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time! This is explicitly designed to pad gameplay hours. It doesn't make any sense why you can't buy a mod from an NPC, find them as rare loot, or craft those special weapon properties yourself. I guess people had too much fun enchanting in Skyrim. Can't have that. Even if you have all the credits and resources to get the specific kind of equipment you want, you have to run around doing this treadmill of mindless nonsense until the game finally lets you have it. And it's all unnecessary because the game never needs you to build a weapon that powerful. You'd lose it anyway when you start a new game plus. Once you finally level up the separate crafting skills and do the challenges and the research, you're done. This is one of the main reasons to keep doing new game plus instead of playing a new character, so you never have to engage with this bullshit ever again. I understand the itemization works the way it does to force you to experiment with a variety of weapons and playstyles, but it doesn't shake out like that because of all the aforementioned issues with combat. So the crafting is then reduced to its essential truth. It was a part of the open world sandbox that was taken out, made as agonizing and grindy as possible, then put back in. This is the core philosophy that broke so much of Starfield's action. When you cram this perpetual play stuff into a single player RPG, it guts the game's verisimilitude and robs the player's ability to feel clever or skilled. The only thing it can do is dole out mediocre half rewards for playing the game the one way Bethesda intended. And this is why any attempt to jam actual RPG mechanics into this was doomed from the start. Starfield skill trees are certainly there. An attempt was made. And I don't mean that facetiously. It feels like someone at Bethesda tried their damnedest to include some actual RPG mechanics within the exceptionally restrictive scope their bosses set out for them. 
Unfortunately, confined as they were by the rest of Starfield's design directives, they were always doomed to fail, mostly for the reasons already mentioned. The vast majority of skills are combat-oriented, and those are typically just flat, boring percentile buffs that you don't need. When you see all these tabs with different labels, your imagination runs wild with everything that they could be used for, how investing in them will develop and define your character. Except the only character you're allowed to play is Commander Shootmans. If you want to play any other kind of character, you're fucked out of luck, kiddo. I think this is best reflected in how the game awards experience points. Levels and skill points are very important because they slow down as you progress. Your earlier investments are the most important ones because there's no ability to respect your skills, while gaining new ones takes longer and longer. Finding the best way to earn XP is a necessary part of the character advancement process, and how a game awards XP reveals what it's actually about, since that's the behavior the game incentivizes the most. I know Starfield isn't about exploration because exploring a planet gives you around 200 XP, while recreating the annihilation of the buffalo in a high-level system gives you more than that per click. The Bethesda loop is so central to Starfield's design that investing skill points outside of it is a complete waste. By design, Starfield enforces a boring, generalist playstyle. Ballistics is necessary, but so is piloting, commerce, lockpicking, and weightlifting. Compared to skills as useful as these, do you think a boost to your scanning range is going to be worthwhile? What about a skill that reduces the amount of materials you need for crafting by a tiny percentage? Absolutely not. Acquiring the third tier of the reloading skill means you are 50% less likely to be interrupted while reloading. When I saw that, I had to take a moment. Even the sweatiest, most hardcore tactical shooters never interrupt your reloading because despite their pursuit of authenticity, they understand how awful it feels to have a reload interrupted. I'd been frustrated all game with reloads not happening and I put up with it because I thought it was a glitch. This was working as intended? This is a crippling overabundance of pointless niche abilities that only exist to pad out the skill trees. Basic ability functionality also had to be stripped away from the sandbox for the same reason. Building your skills like this means you can't reward investment in them either. It is cool that skills sometimes come up in dialogue, but they're almost entirely used as another way to say yes. In some edge cases, they did advance the quest, albeit in insane ways. Even with such basic implementation, this had to be a complete nightmare to add, and I gotta respect it. But as far as I can tell, a single point is all you need for them to pop up. The level of investment doesn't matter. You can invest in Persuade, but the dialogue system is such a mess that it just makes the convincing minigame less painful. I liked that they implemented something like this instead of a simple pass-fail dice roll, but some flaws emerge when you look at it too closely. For one, the choices most likely to succeed are influenced by the target's personality, so if you pay attention to the dialogue, you don't even need persuasion. On the other hand, this forces you to pay attention to the dialogue. And sometimes you get a critical success, so you didn't need to think about it at all. There's no reason to invest in social skills. There's some stealth-oriented skills with similar problems. I actually like the pickpocketing mechanics since it gives you all the relevant information and requires you to be quick and sneaky, but that's as much praise as I can muster. The fact that Starfield doesn't give you a detection meter or the actual ability to pickpocket until you put a point into them is absurd. Furthermore, these mechanics would have meaning if they were ever useful or necessary outside the quest designed to make use of them, and even then the level designers don't commit. Whenever you're doing spy shit for Eugen, everything you could ever want or need to complete the current quest is spoon-fed to you. Here's a ludicrously huge ventilation system to walk around in. Here's a key. There's no room to feel clever or badass because it holds your hand so aggressively. I never felt rewarded for investing in anything, and I don't think my Starfield character is different from anyone else's. There's no incentive to build towards a specific character concept, and the game will always accommodate you regardless of your decisions. I appreciated that there's backgrounds and perks you can select on character creation, but these barely have an impact on how the game is played. They're hardly even flavor. Picking Xenobiologist was cool for the Vanguard quest line because it came up constantly, but again, it was only ever another way of saying yes. It didn't uncover anything new about the quest or add another dimension to it. Outside of the Vanguard stuff, it came up maybe twice? The traits aren't much better. Their tag dialogue options come up infrequently, and they're also just kind of boring. Marginal stat adjustments and fiddly conditional effects don't make the game feel any different. It certainly didn't feel like a core character trait. Even worse is that, true to the rest of Starfield's non-committal design ethos, you can always get rid of said trait with barely any effort. 
I guess it's nice to provide the option, but paying 3,000 credits to some random-ass NPC feels like the laziest, most cowardly way to do that. It's all so disappointing, because this is where Starfield had the most potential. If this stuff is what the rest of the game was built around, instead of the Fallout 4 methodology, I think the game might have had a shot. And no, I'm not asking nor expecting my open-world Bethesda RPG sandbox to be as complex or in-depth as something like Baldur's Gate 3 because that's absurd. They're completely different games with completely different goals. However, even with managed expectations and judging it on its own merits as an action RPG, Starfield utterly fails. Its design choices are confusing nonsense until you realize it's just pretending really hard not to be Fallout 4. Then everything falls into place. More damningly is that sometimes, even Fallout 4's Commonwealth rewarded you for exploring and had some interesting stuff to see. Starfield's exploration, on the other hand, is just as joyless and bafflingly designed as the rest of it. In a game nominally about exploration, the actual act of exploring the settled systems is terrible. The only thing about Starfield that genuinely brought me a sense of wonder and astonishment was that Bethesda watched No Man's Sky's release go down like the Hindenburg, and their conclusion was, yes, thank you, I'll have some more please. This galaxy of procedurally generated planets concept is a bottomless time and money sink that sucked away literal years of developers' lives. Hello Games tried it with No Man's Sky. Bioware tried it with Mass Effect Andromeda, until it blew up in their faces and they had to start over from scratch. RSI is trying it with Star Citizen. Stop it. Get some help. Look, I'm not opposed to devs using procgen tools to help them make environments. Without these sorts of tools, no open world game could exist. The problem is that 1,000 procedurally generated planets were never going to be fun to explore. I understand why devs keep trying to make this happen, because it makes sense for a space game. In theory. Space is massive, and if you want to convey that in your first person action game in a way that feels authentic, you have to find a way to create planets procedurally. In practice, the human brain is way, way too good at pattern recognition. It will pick up on repetitive features almost immediately, which destroys the purpose of having all these planets even be explorable. Once you recognize that a chunk of some moon is the exact same chunk of another planet across a local cluster, both are ruined because you now know how the game is assembling locations. You know you're not going to find Find anything new. Once, I even had a planet that used two of the exact same chunks smeared opposite of each other. What makes this even worse is that all the points of interest on these planets are copy and pasted. In the course of the main quest, I went through the exact same cryo lab. Twice. It is the only kind of cryo lab that you will ever find, and this is also the case for every other single type of location. Every military installation is the same, every ecliptic base, every abandoned relay station, all of it. It's always the exact same level, down to the notes people left lying around. Once you discover this, your drive to explore is destroyed. There's so many planets and moons to walk around on, but you're never rewarded for doing so. In fact, there's so many planets that it disincentivizes exploration because you already know what's there. Nothing. So why bother? This is another reason why I said Bethesda was unequipped to make Starfield, because they fundamentally don't understand what makes space exploration appealing. It's like they think seeing some sci-fi vistas is the only reason to explore the stars. I can't help but find that shallow and myopic. Science fiction jargon and concepts are thrown around like confetti without a moment consideration for what's being said. This can get real nitpicky, like, no, that's not how space works, but others are more foundational. Do you know how much our understanding of biology and consciousness would be upended if we found a sentient colony of microbes? But in Starfield, it's something to check off a list, a word salad of sciency concepts that someone fished out of a bucket, slapped onto the exploration features, and no one bothered to double check. This is what I meant when I said Starfield. Starfield has no investment in its genre or premise. To Bethesda, space exploration means you fly to lots of different planets. End of story. In being so uninterested in science fiction, the game is also disrespecting the player's imagination. It's so focused on letting you land on every planet and presenting you with expansive, procedurally generated vistas, it fails to treat the player as if they're capable of imagining anything beyond that. Let me explain. Bethesda used to employ an environment design technique called representative space. Technology limitations meant that in order to portray the massive fictional worlds they had in their heads, the devs were forced to reduce locations down to their essential elements to convey the idea of a place. They trusted the player's imagination to fill in the gaps and intuit that these locations are actually much larger than they appear in game, or at least feel that way. In Morrowind, Balmora is a small town of just under 100 people, but due to the way the NPCs talk about it in the importance it plays in the region, your mind pictures the real Balmora as something like this. 
that's representative space. However, Bethesda is moving farther and farther away from this because they don't trust their audience to get it. They don't trust the player to be capable of imagining anything that's not depicted for them one to one. This has the opposite effect, making the spaces depicted feel too small to feel real, yet too big to feel representative. New Atlantis is tiny for what is essentially the new center of human civilization. However, what if everything about it was exactly the same, but it was a limited area called the Spaceport District and was surrounded by a backdrop that showed it sprawling out into the landscape? Game. You might not have been able to walk around the entire city, but it would have felt more believable as a space. Your imagination would have filled it with people and places and stories. Everything the narrative was trying to say about the United Colonies would have been elevated because it would have been that much more real and important to the player. The way it exists in the game now, it's like they were terrified of having invisible walls. But then their instance procedural generation system has them anyway? On that note, I understand why people prefer single, giant, contiguous maps in their open-world games. However, I also understand and accept why Starfield was built the way it was. As a planet-hopping sci-fi adventure, its environments had to be broken up into disparate planets connected by loading screens. Sure, these could have been disguised a little better, but feeling like you're teleporting around the galaxy isn't the problem. It's that when you fast travel, you know that wherever you end up is always going to be the most interesting part of that planet. It's not the travel mechanics, it's a problem with structure, scope, and design directives. They went about exploration with a flawed mentality. This is already an ice-cold take, but I think the settled systems should have been 30 to 40 handcrafted planets with larger, more bespoke maps. This way, the idea of a planet could be conveyed more succinctly, feel more real, and be more engaging to explore. There'd be more incentive to seek them out because you wouldn't know what you'd find. You'd see these more curated, interesting worlds, and that would spark the imagination, because you're being led to believe that other places like them might exist beyond the game's limitations. As they are presented in-game, the player intuitively understands that each planet is a random seed that stitches a couple of pallet swap tile sets together. Therefore, they won't be encouraged to see more, and they certainly won't care what's beyond the game's boundaries, they already know the answer. I'm even more confident that a smaller number of handcrafted planets would be the right call because the handmade locations that are already in the game are pretty good. Sarah's companion quest line takes you to a really engaging slice of Cassiopeia with winding elevation and interwoven foliage. They can make interesting environments. It's impressive that each planet has a day-night cycle based on local hours. It's even more impressive that they have dynamic skyboxes based on nearby planetary bodies. I even like the varying levels of gravity and atmosphere and the effect that can have on your character. There's different types of hazards and weather effects that can inflict all sorts of debuffs. It's the bones of an interesting system, but it's all made so trivial out of an imagined necessity, like the player would get frustrated if the injuries were more than slaps on the wrist. The issue of variety and intent also comes up with the alien fauna in the game. I like their designs, but they are also copy-pasted everywhere, making subsequent appearances feel less special and revealing that they only exist so you can click on them with your scanner. When you actually do the planet hopping Starfield is built around, it becomes more and more obvious that it was built this way to facilitate radiant quests, not real exploration. Sure, you can survey a ton of planets for constellation, but it's pointless, inefficient busy work that shoves the game's problems in your face even harder. Even worse is that scanner data is wiped between New Game Pluses, the thing the game wants you to pursue, just so you can click on all those plants again for a handful of credits and a pittance of XP. Do you want to tell a story about exploration and imagination, Bethesda, or do you want to tell a story about grinding? I think the real shame here is that the proc gen tools were primarily used for planet map creation. With so much gameplay focus on the shooting and looting, Starfield would have been much better served if, like Daggerfall, it was the dungeons that were randomized instead. There's nothing quite so demoralizing to an exploration experience like seeing the exact same place being presented as a different location. Exploring the settled systems outside the quest marker is so awful, I'm convinced Bethesda didn't intend for you to do it. So why have this feature at all? While I mention it, it's time for a brief rant on the UI. Yes, the handhold and quest markers are back, but they were never going anywhere. I'm not shocked they've returned. Instead, I want to highlight that playing this game is an exercise in frustration for all the aforementioned reasons, and you have to fight the UI at every step of the way. It's really bad, clearly designed for controllers. Even then, there's so much stuff that's hidden in menus, so much wasted space and odd decisions that I don't think controller users will have a much better time navigating it. Stuff that feels like it should be front and center is tucked away somewhere puzzling, comparing gear is confusing, and everything is excessively clicky or assigned to weird buttons that are all packed too closely together. For example, if you want to build at one of your outposts, you have to pull up your scanner, hold E, then navigate through the tabs to build mode before you can do anything. Also, god the outpost system sucks. 
Cards on the table, I hated this asinine dog shit in Fallout 4, and I was none too pleased to see it return. I understand why they have this system, but it never fails to feel like a complete waste of time. It takes an absurd amount of time and resources to construct a functional outpost, and again, it'll be wiped the next time you enter Unity. Building one settlement was exhausting, existentially challenging even. I have no idea why anyone would make more. As far as I can tell, the only way to enjoy the same feature in Fallout 4 was to mod the restrictions out. That doesn't mean it was a good system, just that it was ill-conceived. Did Bethesda learn their lesson in time for Starfield? Hell no. While they wisely curtailed the amount of action surrounding your outpost, they still believed in the concept as a decent time waster. There's no good reason to build them though, because the gameplay system they're designed to support is crafting, which, again, is fucking terrible. Therefore, the one reason to interact with the outpost is to further enmesh yourself into one of the worst aspects of the entire game. Sure, it can act as a base for the player with crafting benches and storage space for all the crap they collected, but so can your ship. You know, the thing you always have and always need in order to do literally anything in the game. Another victim of maximalist game design. It's cool that you can build outposts, I guess, but it doesn't add anything to the experience, so there's no reason to have it except to waste some of the player's time, and that kind of sums up exploration as a whole. It's another part of the gameplay loop that was reduced down to its simplest, most basic form, had a bunch of stuff stapled on top, then put back in. It's not exploration, not really, and that's a shame. The reason this hurts so much is because I can kind of see a decent game in Starfield if I pretended something else entirely. I feel like I have to fight this game to enjoy it on any level, yet it's obvious how hard people worked on it. So, all of this time and effort and talent was wasted. It's one of the most bizarre gaming experiences I've ever had, a confounding mix of overblown scope and short-sighted ambition. The game was ambitious in terms of raw scale and nothing else. If Bethesda's upper management had curtailed their fallacious directives in a few key areas, is, there's a good chance Starfield could have been something interesting. Instead, everything in the game, its art, its music, its gameplay, its UI, its spaceships, and settlements, and characters are dedicated to the grandest future amongst the cosmos that Bethesda can imagine, clicking on rocks and shooting the bad men until they fall down. Just because the game has so much stuff to do and you can do it all within the same game doesn't elevate those individual systems into something worth your time. Being able to customize, pilot, and walk around your spaceship doesn't mean anything when you only use it as a storage locker and space combat is so flat. Being able to walk around on planets and find stuff there doesn't mean anything when it's always the same things with nothing to do or say. Being able to visit colonies and talk to the people there doesn't go anywhere because their purpose is to house radiant mission boards and NPCs that give you fetch quests with lifeless stories. Being able to build outposts doesn't mean anything because they're just there to force you to grind for resources, for more outpost stuff. From a technological standpoint, it's incredibly impressive that you can do all of this in one game, but I keep circling back to why. Game systems should interact and reinforce each other, not stand in isolation. This is also why I cared so much about the writing being flat. If we cared about the characters, if the plot wasn't a loose thread of linear fetch quests and had interesting themes to explore, everything else in the game would have been elevated as a result. All the gameplay issues would still exist, but it'd be worth enduring them to see more story. Instead, it's a field of rakes. The stilted, monotonous story forces me to acknowledge that the gameplay doesn't have legs. The flat, repetitive gameplay forces me to acknowledge that the narrative doesn't have anything going on, and there was nowhere to go. It was designed this way. At this point, you're probably screaming at me, what about mods? Modders always fix Bethesda games, they're just platformed for mods. There was even a mod for the UI before the game released. That is, missing the point. There's so much wrong with this line of thinking. First and foremost, free, unpaid labor shouldn't be required to fix a AAA game with a development cycle this long and a budget this massive. It's commendable that Bethesda has been so accommodating to the modding community over the years, but these days you can't take that for granted. Moreover, this game was in development for eight years. There was time and money to do the work modders resigned themselves to. No, the reason so many Bethesda game mod lists look like CVS receipts is because they're broken in the same ways. They're built broken on purpose, because endless, mindless engagement is the only thing they care about. You can fix the UI, you can fix the skill trees, you can fix the loot, the bugs, the performance, the level scaling, the ship combat, the encumbrance system, the difficulty, the crafting, and the AI. You can add new quest lines and NPCs and companions and weapons and ship parts and planets and dungeons and locations and factions, but you can't mod out the settled systems. 
The setting was written and designed around everything you just spent all that time fixing. At the end of the day, however much you mod Starfield, the game world will not be interesting enough to make that effort worthwhile. You'll still have to go to these boring planets and talk to these boring characters to advance lifeless, linear quests that go nowhere. Now, another mega mod project like Enderall might come along, where a crew of talented creators will remix all these systems and assets into an entirely new game with a new setting that's worth experiencing. But how long will that take? More importantly, how could I ask anyone to spend that kind of time and energy? So then, is Starfield gonna get a 2.0 patch like Cyberpunk, or will it be left to languish? Bethesda says they want this game to last for years, but frankly speaking, I don't think the settled systems are interesting enough to keep people engaged for that long. More damningly, I don't think it'll keep modders engaged, but that remains to be seen. It is possible that someone far more talented and intelligent than I am might pick up the rakes and find a way to make Starfield sing but I won't hold my breath. Lots of people, myself included, were looking to Starfield to see the direction Bethesda was going to go after their latest titles, and I think that question has been answered. Good news, you no longer have to endlessly speculate about what The Elder Scrolls Six will be like. You've already played it. It'll be just like Starfield in Fallout 4 and Skyrim. Some gameplay systems might be shuffled around, but it isn't going to feel meaningfully distinct. The only thing they can do by setting their game in a different part of Tamriel is to retroactively make that region more boring with inane retcons. Hammerfell, High Rock, elsewhere, it doesn't matter. It'll be full of just alright time-wasting gameplay systems and bland, confusing, sterile writing. It's not even their fault, and I'm not even mad. We all bought Skyrim, we all bought Fallout 4, and we all bought Starfield, desperately believing this one might be it. To paraphrase Warlocracy, a much better YouTuber, part of these games' decline is on Todd. Most of it is on us. I'll offer one last piece of unsolicited advice. In a single-player RPG, the amount of play hours doesn't matter as much as the time spent thinking about it. Putting the player on a dopamine treadmill won't last forever. Eventually, inevitably, they'll hit diminishing returns. And then, their memories of the experience will amount to a shrug, and an, it was alright, I guess. If you care about anything except sales numbers, maximalist game design is inherently flawed. The only reason I decided to write a criticism this thorough is to illustrate how and why. If your game wants to be everything for everyone forever, you better bring your A-game. Starfield did not. So, Starfield sucks. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at least a little disappointed. Everything about it looks like it'd be right up my alley, but it didn't respect my time, intelligence, agency, or imagination. It won't respect yours either. Starfield is on Game Pass, but I'd argue that even then it's not worth it. Even if you're intrigued by the premise of Starfield, actually playing it and paying attention to what it's saying will reveal its most damning sin. It's not about anything. No modern Bethesda game is. You can see a beautiful vista, you can appreciate a well-modeled object. You can marvel at how sleek and cohesive and grand it all is, but it will never reward you with a meaning behind that. The aesthetics are all that's left. At least with Skyrim and Fallout 4 you might have made the argument that they're fun to play, but I find that is no longer the case. Starfield's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is a barren wasteland of isolated systems that are designed to waste your time and nothing else beyond that. However, I don't want to end the video on a downer. Real quick, here's a few games that might scratch that space exploration itch, and are also just brilliant games that are worth your time. Outer Wilds is the premier space exploration game. It might not have the hard sci-fi sheen of Starfield, but it's truly about exploration, and everything that entails. I'd say more, but I won't spoil you. Deep Rock Galactic has an incredible core gameplay loop, a little like Left 4 Dead, but with excellent progression systems and procedurally generated missions that are fun and varied. Its difficulty levels also let you choose the kind of experience you want, from Brain Off Mining Sim to Colonial Marine Simulator. It's one of the best co-op action games ever made. Arcane's Prey, from 2016, is an immersive sim with meaningful RPG mechanics, and your first time exploring Talos 1 is one of the most entertaining and rewarding gaming experiences on offer. Star Sector is everything Starfield was trying to be, only as a top-down fleet management game instead of a first-person RPG. You can do everything you can do in Starfield, except it's given real weight due to its challenging nature and dynamic simulation elements. Star Sector has just as many raiding quests as Starfield, but because the world actually reacts to each one, they're elevated into something fun and meaningful. They feel like beats in a story you make for yourself. Each of these, on their own, will give you so much more than Starfield ever can. In a way, however, I'm glad to have played it. 
I can finally break the Bethesda cycle. I will not be playing Elder Scrolls 6. There's plenty of other ways to enjoy that universe these days, and they're developed by people who care. Furthermore, there's been a glut of great games released in 2023, from the AAA sphere to AA projects to the smallest indie teams. A fantastic year for video games, if not for the people who made them. But the industry is changing, slowly but surely. The audience for games has never been larger, and they're hungry for new, engaging experiences. The Bethesda RPG isn't intellectual property, it's a network of interconnected systems and game design philosophies that occasionally cohere into something incredible. Eventually, another studio will make a good Bethesda game. I can't wait to play it. Thanks for watching.